Good morning. It's great to be with you today. Great to spend some time with you. And we're going to open the scriptures together and I hope that you'll be blessed by doing so. The title of the message today is a question and the question is, does God work all things together for good? In Romans 8.28, it says that God works all things together for good. In certain translations, it uses that phrase. In Romans 8.28, let's just look at that together. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You know, I've heard this said so often, you know, almost let's sit back, let's relax, let's do nothing because all things work together for good. Let's have a fatalistic view of God. Let's let's believe that God is in control of everything and has a Machiavellian plan and is using even all the evil stuff. It's all redemptive. Can I suggest to you that that is a faulty foundation? That is a faulty foundation and is not the God that Jesus Christ reveals. And that we need to adjust that foundation. 95% of people in our nation, the nation of the UK, don't know Jesus. They're not interested in, in church, not interested in, in the message we carry. Why? Because the message we carry has been altered to bring in religion instead of life. The gospel, the unadulterated gospel, is gracious and life-giving, and we need to return to it and return to the foundation that God is good, he's always good, that God does not bring bad things in our lives to teach us something, that God does not bring illnesses and viruses into our world to teach us something, that the coronavirus is not the wake-up call for the church, the coronavirus, no matter what prophet says so, is not there to get the church out of the building. You know, these sort of things are just absolutely ridiculous and are not part of the heart of God. It's really important that we understand that. And I would suggest to you that this, this verse that's given out of context so much, all things work together for good, is literally needs to be understood in the context it's given but also needs to be understood that it's not as sure to actually quote that verse that way. So, for example, in the English Standard Version, it says that it can be translated either all things or in all things. That God works in all things as we allow him to in partnership with us, but God doesn't cause all things to work together for good there's a subtle difference and it's a, it's an important difference that god works in partnership with us to bring good out of all things you know a person that had a big influence on my life and was a blessing to me and saw something in me that many others didn't see and probably still don't see uh, was a man called Bryn jones and he uh took me under his wing for a few years and spent a lot of time with him we went for curries together i drove up and down the country to different events and fellowshiped and spent time gleaning from him and, and listening to him he was a wonderful man of god and one of the things he said was which i don't know if it was his quote or he got it from somebody else but he said this he said god has a wonderful way of scooping up our spilt milk and making it into double cream I love that phrase, don't you? God has a wonderful way of scooping up our spilt milk and making it into double cream. God will work with us for the good in all things as we partner with him, but it's important that we understand that God is looking for partnership. It's not fa he's not into fatalism. God doesn't control all things, and we, we, we can't be those that in all things, in all the, some of the negative stuff, the awful stuff that happens to ourselves and other people. We're not to be those that, that in some kind of religious deception, praise God even for the terrible stuff. We can praise God in the midst of all things, but not for all things. There's a big difference. Don't get into that religious claptrap of praising God for everything that comes into your life. No, some things that come into your life are to be resisted. Some things that try and come into your life are to be halted. Some things that come into your life are to be rejected. But some things that come into your life, we can praise God for. And we can be blessed. And most of the, those things 
In fact, all those things uh, will be of benefit to us in some way along the road. Wrong, along the road. We all need people to come into our lives to disagree with us, to sharpen us, to correct us, to bring alignment. We all need to have some kind of accountable relationships. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about rejecting stuff that is not from the hand of God. And sickness is not from the hand of God. And viruses are not from the hand of God. To teach the church something or teach people something. This faulty foundation needs to be dealt with. In Genesis chapter 50, there's a beautiful statement by Joseph. After all he'd been through, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers because they were unhappy that he'd told them the dream that he had, that he would be over them and they would bow down to him and, he, and they, they beat him and sold him to slavery. He was then falsely accused at the hand of Potiphar's wife. Potiphar threw him in prison. And in prison he was not treated well by people who promised him things. So he had all sorts of different heartaches and hardships to go through that were really serious. Anyway, he comes through it all. He ends up being second in the whole of Egypt, the prime minister of Egypt under Pharaoh. His brothers come to see him because they need food because their own land is in famine. And he says this to them in Genesis 50, 20, 20, verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is to this day to save many people. And I've heard many talks on the sovereignty of God where this particular verse is quoted. You see, God meant all the bad things that happened to you he meant for your good all the terrible things that happened to you are, are redemptive in some way for your good can i say this that god can redeem and heal you and heal me of the awful things that happened to me but those things didn't come in as some kind of plan from god those things didn't come into our life as a gift from god those things are not from him and it's really important we understand that. The word meant here, when it's quoted of Joseph saying, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. The word meant is, is, is literally in Hebrew, the idea of weaving something. So basically, Joseph was saying to his brothers, when you were weaving all this evil into my life, at the same time, God was weaving good. You see, this world system, the devil, evil may have a plan for your life, but God has a much better plan. And God has a plan in which he partners with you to discover that plan. He doesn't, he's not, he's not made it so micromanaged. He wants to work with you in the, into unfolding a beautiful plan in partnership with you. It's really important we get that. People often say, what's God's plan for my life? Well, God's plan for your life is, is multifaceted, creative and beautiful and he wants to walk with you in it to find it it's all about relationship with god god is not controlling god is not machiavellian god is not uh, into putting bad things on you to teach you something all those things god is not manipulative these things are all fear-based and you know <clears throat> so often we've been at the mercy of manipulative coercive and controlling people in our lives whether it may be in family life or in church life or in society those people and those things don't represent the lord they don't represent jesus every behavior that we've been into and each one of us have probably at some point been in that kind of fear behavior of coercing and manipulation and trying to control situations and people can i suggest to you none of that is god it's completely an antithesis to his nature. He's love. He's not into control. So at the same time that his brothers were weaving evil into his life, God was weaving good. It literally backs up the idea that in all things, God works to the good. Not he works all things to the good, but in all things, he works to the good. It's really important we get that. You see, God is love. 1 John 4, 16. And Jesus said this, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So God will act towards us the way Jesus acts towards us. In James chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, 
It says this, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers, brothers and sisters. Every good, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Now listen to that, those two verses in the message. So my very dear friends, don't get thrown off course. Every desirable, good and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gifts are rivers of light cascading down from the Father of light. There is nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. Wow. The nature, in the nature of God, there is nothing deceitful, there is nothing two-faced, and there is nothing fickle. God will always tell you the truth because he's good. God will always be single-hearted and single-minded towards you. He won't say one thing to your face, another thing behind your back to somebody else. He'll always be true to you. And he's not fickle. What does that mean? He doesn't blow hot and cold. One minute he's not for you and the next minute he's against you. One minute he's not passionate towards you and the next minute he's not. He's always passionate towards you. He's always for you and he always loves you. He's not fickle. And when you see these behaviours in society, in the church, in humanity, of deceit and two-facedness and, 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 and behaving in a fickle way towards others, this does not represent the nature of God. And these behaviours, I think, are there as well as controlling behaviour because many of us have not encountered and seen a revelation of the nature of God. You know, people have said to me, you know, Jeff, you, you seem to be getting very liberal these days. You know, some of the things you're coming out with are liberal. You know, people who are, are, are progressive, you're a progressive Christian. No, I, I'm not I'm not liberal. Progressive uh, for me is, is a strange term because I, I would like to progress in my understanding of my faith and my relationship with God. I like to go deeper and, and enjoy more intimacy. Um, progressive is a word I, I, I struggle with really but certainly I'm not liberal in, in my views on certain things so you know people say well what do you believe on abortion well I believe that abortion is not in the heart of God and that particularly social abortion is not right but I'm not here to judge the world I'm here to bring the gospel and the gospel is that which changes people's behavior not me judging them do you understand so people say well, what about what about the marriage issue well i believe what jesus says that a man should leave his mother and father be joined to his wife and the two should become one so the christian marriage is between a man and a woman and no matter how much we try and mar that with different gender identities god has made male and female and those things are important but i'm not here to judge people i'm here to bring the gospel and the gospel is what changes people's hearts because a lot of the behaviors and situations we find in our society and a lot of the rebellion against uh, god and righteousness is because they've never really seen or been shown what God is really like and all been shown what Jesus is really like if you look in the Gospels people of very dubious moral quality <laughs> love to be around Jesus it was the religious that hated him so it's important that we realize that Jesus was not liberal and neither am I we are part of the kingdom of God and also we're not nationalistic either can I say that I I fix my eyes on Jesus the author and finisher of my faith i don't fix my eyes on a flag or a nationality or a nation that is not where my help comes from or my salvation comes from my salvation comes from jesus so i'm not becoming liberal i'm just enjoying knowing how good god is <laughs> and how loving he is is that okay <coughs> you know when we see this phrase, all things, in Romans 8.28, it 
it really in the English Standard Version it says in the notes of, of this verse that it, some manuscripts can translate it all things work together for good and other manuscripts saying that God works in the midst of all things for the good I would suggest that the second one is a better translation that God works in all things for the good he doesn't, he doesn't work all things together for good because all the things that happen, some things that happen, are perversions of his created order. Something that happens to us are not from love, but from, from fear. So he doesn't work in those things, but he works in the midst of those things for our good, for our benefit. In the NIV, it says that, really, in Romans 8, 28 the niv translation and we know that in all things god works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose in all things god works for the good so he's working for the good okay it's really important we get this in ephesians 5 verses 17 to 21 we're tall told about receiving more of the holy spirit not, get drink, not to get drunk on wine, but to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things. That phrase, all things. Can I suggest it's not giving thanks for all things? That I don't want to give thanks for, you know, I've had a close family member pass away and go to heaven during this season. I don't give thanks for that death. But I do give thanks in the midst of that death for the life that was lived. Do you understand? So we, we don't have a view that God brings all things into our lives. But we have a view that in the midst of all things, God will work good if we work with him. We allow him to. It's really important. It's a subtle difference because one side gives you a fatalistic, God is in control, sovereignty view. The other side gives a partnership view of God that's based on love. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19, Paul addresses rich people and he says this in verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be proud, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let these rich people do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may hold on to eternal life. So, Paul says here that God has given us, seemingly given us all things richly to enjoy, but the context is important, that God has given us provision to enjoy richly. All the provision he's given, is all things is in the context of something else. It's not literally all things. So it's really important that we don't take this phrase, all things, and, and, and apply it to everything that comes into our life, because there's a context. Let's look at the context in Romans 8, 28. It's really important we look at the context. So let's look from verse 26, Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. So it's talking about relationship with the Holy Spirit. For we do not know what we ought, should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be utter, uttered. You know, with some of the things that happen in our society at times, I don't know what to pray. I'll, I'll be honest, I, I, I just have to allow the Holy Spirit to pray through me. That's why it's so important that we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, yes, with joy and other manifestations, but with prophecy and speaking in tongues, because it builds up our most holy faith and it's a help to our intimacy with the Lord to be able to speak directly from our spirit and bypass some of the things that are going on in our mind. It's really important. So sometimes we don't know what to pray, but the Spirit praise through us with groanings that cannot be uttered now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of god and we see the thing is when you pray in the spirit you pray in the will of god and we know that all things work together for good to those who love god so the context of verse 28 all things working together for good 
is the context is those who pray in the Spirit, those who pray in intimacy with the Holy Spirit, those who allow the Holy Spirit to pray through them, allow themselves to be a mouthpiece and a vessel for the Holy Spirit to pray through, to intercede through, to stand in the gap. Those people and those things, God works to the good. It's not all things he works to the good. It's those prayers and those intercessions and those deep groanings and those things we pray through with him and those times of intimacy. He works all that together for the good of not just ourselves, but to save many other people if we take up that call to intercede. You see, it's important we don't take Romans 8, 28 out of context and make it into a fatalistic sovereignty scripture. When the context is actually partnership and intercession and and working with God, bringing ourselves into a rest by the Spirit so he can work in the earth. It's really important that we get that. You know, in the Old Testament, another scripture that's often quoted to bring up the faulty fence of ultra-sovereignty is from Daniel chapter 4 verse 17 where Nebuchadnezzar says, that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. And that scripture is quoted, it's quoted a bit later in the same book as well, that the, the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he will. But actually the first part of verse 17 of Daniel chapter 4 says this, The decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. Have you noticed? The decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may see the the rule of God come in. So it's the idea that as the church stops trying to find a new methodology or stops trying to deconstruct everything or stops trying to blame leadership and blame church all the time for the mess we're in and starts to partnership with God in intercession in the secret place, uh, starts to, to, to pray like we've never prayed before, starts to ask God for a burning desire to pray if we've never prayed and, and not just not pray sovereignty prayers but pray Uh, prayers that are in partnership with the Holy Spirit, even groanings and intercessions that are deep. If we we do that, then God can work good. If we do that, the rule of God can come in. What's the rule of God? Benevolence. Not a benevolent dictator, but love. In Isaiah it says there'll be a throne established in love. And that throne is established as we partner with him in intercession. Don't get into fatalism. Don't start quoting Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. We can just let rest in our laurels. No, it's time to partner. It's time to intercede. It's time to see COVID-19 disappear from the earth. It's time to see the church arise. It's time to see the nations won to Jesus. It's time to see the mess that's in our society through people's selfishness, people's rebellion, people's hurt, people's pain, people's rejection. Uh, people's people's abuse of one another it's time to see that be completely and utterly covered and overwhelmed by love which covers a multitude of sins it's time for us to really represent our father and represent jesus and jesus represents god fully and he's calling us to do the same as the people of god rome acts 10 verse 38 says God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him so Jesus went about in the power of the spirit doing good in the midst of a generation and a society that was full of religion and full of negativity and full of hypocrisy and judgmentalism and liberalism and hedonism. Jesus went about doing good, bestowing benefits and healing. You know the phrase healing there is setting free and making whole. He was healing, setting free and making whole all who were oppressed by the devil. You know the word oppressed means to exercise illegitimate authority or control over somebody. So fear, the devil, sometimes wicked people have exercised illegitimate authority, control in your life 
And some religious people have said that's God when it's not. God is not into control. And Jesus came with the anointing of the Holy Spirit because God was with him. God's with him. Have you noticed what God being with you, what the result of that is? It's bestowing good, bestowing benefits, serving goodness and healing, setting free and making whole. So Jesus set people free from the control of fear and the control of the enemy, but didn't say, now I'm going to control you. He just set them free and made them whole to make their own decision. That's really powerful. You see, God is love and God is good. He upholds all things. He doesn't control all things. He's looking for partnership with us in prayer. He's not looking to dictate to us in some sovereign king rule that's based on a worldly idea. If we rest in him, he works on our behalf. You know what? God is all about scooping up our spilt milk and making it into double cream. All things are not from God, but we can praise God in the midst of all things because as we partner with him in the midst of all things, he will bring about good. You know, one of the Greek words to describe good in the New Testament is beautiful. If we allow our Father to work with us, he will make everything beautiful in its time. Bless you. Have a great day. See you again soon.